Welcome back to the British Undergraduate Review. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Peter Gardwell, former Special Advisor to four Cabinet Ministers across four government departments and author, author of The Secret Life of Special Advisors, which I must say is a phenomenal read for any student of politics. Peter, thanks so much for joining me today. Oh, thanks for having me. Well, as the title of your new book suggests, Special Advisors are said to operate in a murky political underworld, a far cry you could say, from life as a journalist in front of the camera. You write in your book that you felt like you'd accomplished everything you set out to in journalism. Um, but what drew you from the limelight into the shadows of political life? It's a really interesting question. And I think it was just the inspiration that I've had from other special advisors, people like Fiona Hill, uh, Paul Stevenson, who's now a very important person, although not a special advisor, uh, who was, was a spad at that time and now is involved with Hanbury Strategy, which advises uh, Downing Street and many others. Um, there are people like Katie Waring, for example, at the business department, she was a Liberal Democrat actually, um, who just inspired me and were very, very good, professional, interesting people who seem to be doing a fascinating job. And uh, I mean, I loved uh, journalism. I did it for 10 years. I really enjoyed it. As I wouldn't rule out going back and doing something like that in the future. But uh, what I, you know, to be a special advisor is a rare privilege. It doesn't come to many people. Um, I was asked to do it after I'd sent in my CV. Of course, I wanted to do it, but it was just a really fun thing to do, a real privilege to do for three and a half years. And even though it's about someone else, it's not about you. Um, you have to kind of um, put your life second and, and put someone else's life in front of that, well, that's okay because it's just for a short time. And uh, with me, it was three and a half years. I was lucky I got a bit longer than most people get about two years, your political mayfly really. But it was um, it was an amazing experience. And I I, I wouldn't, uh, I mean, you're, you are in the shadows, as you say, you're not a public figure, but that's maybe not a bad thing after 10 years of uh, sort of being on TV and radio and so on. It was probably not, not, not the worst. Well, you mentioned there how you sent in your CV to the then Chief of Staff, uh, to Theresa May, um, who, and, and then within a week, you were working, after sending in your CV, you were working within the Northern Ireland office. Uh, clearly, that didn't give you a lot of time to prepare. And a recent Institute for Government report recommends, recommended that advisors be given more professional support and further induction training. Would you have welcomed such support when you began? Yes, I think that report, I read that report by the Institute for Government. I think it's a very good thing. Uh, I think that there are, there were various bits of training there, but most of the, as I say in the book, I mean, most of the training or mentoring I got was, <clears throat> excuse me, or mentoring was from more senior special advisors who'd been kind of round the block and had seen everything and had been there for a long time. People like uh, Sheridan Westlake, who's been there for uh, the, the, I think he's the only person actually, minister or special advisor, who's been there for the, the whole of the time the Conservatives have been in power since 2010. Um, and uh, Amy Fisher, who's a great friend as well, another senior special advisor, she's now actually at the Northern Ireland office, has returned there. But no, there should be more formal induction, more formal training, because you are thrown in at the deep end. And even something like Northern Ireland, obviously I'm from there, I thought I knew the policy, but I really didn't. And it took me a while to catch up and what a special advisor's life and working life were all about. What do you think the secret was to this special advisor, Sheridan Wesley, who's, who you speak about in the book, what do you think his secret is to lasting so long in the job? Uh, yes, I say in the book, if he, you know, if they're in the event of a nuclear bomb, it's probably a good idea to stand somewhere near Sheridan Wesley. Um, <laughs> I think he uh, is someone who has a lot of integrity, a lot of experience, um, and he knows, he's made himself indispensable. He knows a lot of things that a lot of people don't know about how things work in the civil service, uh, about he's the sort of shop steward and knows uh, about pensions and contracts and all the rest of it. So really he's made himself indispensable. He's also somebody who works extremely hard and is an extremely nice person as well. Um, so it's good that someone like that has survived so long. These are almost certainly qualities that all special advisors manifest. Um, I, I mean, in your opinion, what do you think is the single most important quality for a special advisor to have? Oh gosh, that's a tough question. Um, I would say trying, I, th I think just realizing your role and realizing that, you know, you've got to sometimes take a bullet for your boss. Uh, sometimes you've got to, um, you know, you're, you're entirely dispensable, um, but also that you play a fundamentally important role in protecting your minister and doing all that you can to ensure that he or she uh, has the, the right 
access to the right information, is meeting the right people, is doing the right media interviews, is talking to the right people in number 10. Um, I think the two things that uh, special advisors can bring um, that others, that others, you know, impartial civil servants can't, is knowing their minister's mind. And you have a tremendous amount of access. You have access no civil servant has. Um, I mean, with James Brokenshire, for example, who I spoke with, Exeter, Exeter, Exeter lad, uh, went to Exeter University, and uh, I spoke to him mostly first thing in the morning and last thing at night. I knew his mind really well, and could, even to this day can kind of predict how he will react to certain situations and prepare accordingly. Um, so I think it's really important to um, ensure that you know your minister's mind and also that you have links to number 10 and you know how things can get done and really that's the the element that a special advisor brings i think that uh, others others can't after reading your book i i came came away with one overwhelming impression and that was that you by when you're trying to secure yourself employment as a special special advisor um one of the qualities you do need is the ability to impress a minister a cabinet minister in a short amount of time, often at short notice. Do you think your education as a journalist prepared you well for this? Yes, uh, Arden, that's a great question. And I think that um, as you go through life, often you've got to talk to people uh, about complex issues very quickly. And I think that I was lucky in that in journalism, often you've got to get people to kind of trust you quite quickly uh, so they can tell you stuff about often the most traumatic or dramatic time in their life um, in, in terms of an interview. So that's something that you just need to to kind of bear in mind, I suppose. But uh, no, I, I mean, I was very lucky in that um, my journalistic career allowed me to meet a lot of different people from both senior politicians and, um, and people who just happen to be in the news for whatever reason. And the trick is just to treat everybody with exactly the same respect and um, hopefully have a bit of integrity about it and let, leave them feeling as if you're going to do a good job but with you know, the material you have as a journalist. And also in politics, I think trust is the key thing. You've got to be able to uh, know all sorts of details, um, you know, many of which are not and will never be in any book. Uh, about people's lives, about people's marriages, about people's children, um, about their finances, about all sorts of things that um, you know you're trusted with, and you need to be. Um, I mean, you need to be very, very careful with that information. So, um, look, I think there will probably be some people who say you wrote this book, you betrayed people's confidences, and so on. I don't feel that's the case, um, and I certainly haven't had any particular blowback from the book. But yeah, it's it's very important just to to gain people's trust and to have the same friends at the end of an experience or a job or, or, or a book that you've written um, and I need it at the start. Given your exposure to all sorts of people from all walks of life and especially in very senior levels of, again, all areas, areas of life, have you, I guess, taken note or found a common thread amongst these sorts of people, some kind of lessons you've learned from your exposure? Yeah. Yeah, I think people operating at a high level are generally quite, um, quite. it takes them a while to trust people, it takes them a while to kind of form any form of uh, relationship that isn't just superficial, because, you know, often people in public life know a lot of people, uh, there are a lot of people who, who they will have met once, and then they'll maybe come up to them again and say, hey, do you remember that time, or great to see you again, and they just don't know who the person is because they have maybe thousands of people in their life. Most people have maybe, you know, a hundred or a couple of hundred people in, in their life. Imagine you have thousands of people in your life and you can't remember the exact context, but for that one person meeting, you know, Boris Johnson was a big day in their life, whereas for Boris Johnson it was just kind of another day where he's meeting meeting people all the time kind of thing. So um, it's, I think it's important um, to remember that uh, you know, for for these people in public life, often they're just having a normal day, whereas for you, it's a kind of an incredible uh, privilege often to, to meet them or even be in the same room as them. So um, it's, but I, I certainly think that most people are very similar. Most people uh, have the same goals and most people in politics, not everybody, but most people in politics want life to be better for people. And they have, they're coming from a, a general, generally similar thread, really. I just want to go back to your attraction to the job of, of being a special advisor. Um, a lot of special advisors cite proximity to power as an attraction to the job, but the reality is often different when a desire to get things done in Westminster uh, so often meets political and bureaucratic resistance. In your own proximity to power, 
to what extent did you find political power illusory? Um, it's not really illusory. It is there. Um, you can do some things. The problem is you need to bring people with you. If you want to do almost anything in uh, Whitehall in the corridors of power, you need to bring the Treasury with you. You need to bring number 10 with you. Um, and if it's not in the manifesto or something which is subsequent to the manifesto that makes sense, you're going to have trouble. Um, it's very difficult for ministers to go on solo runs. Uh, they can't really spend money without the Treasury's approval. Um, so it's it's really about bringing people with you. And that kind of consensus building is a, a major, major part of it. And that's often how power is really exercised. Um, there is sometimes resistance from the civil service who say, oh, well, this will be, you know, hugely problematic in five years time, whereas you're not thinking that you're thinking, you know, my minister's got 18 months to two years. We need to make an impression. We need to build a legacy here. Um, but no, there, there's no doubt there is tremendous power. There is for special advisors as well. Uh, many special advisors are more powerful than junior ministers. Um, some special advisors are more powerful than, than cabinet uh, secretaries of state. Um, so, you know, it, it, it is there. Um, it is attractive, definitely, in that you can get things done and you can help people and you can build a legacy for your minister. Um, and, you know, there's, there's no doubt about that. But often there are, you know, very, very difficult times, including, as I say in the book, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the confidence of supply arrangement um, the, after the 2017 election. Um, it was you know, very, very difficult uh, for, a, for a long time uh, because of the lack of a majority. But even with an 80 strong majority, Boris Johnson is having you know, significant trouble at the moment with a number of things. So that doesn't necessarily guarantee uh, that you have power. Uh, so you know, it's, it's a really interesting dynamic and often where power lies is not exactly where you think it is. Sometimes you can get things done. For example, I mean, this is, this is sort of a little bit technical, but a lot of people come to you and say, oh, we need a change in the law. Often you don't need a change in the law, you just need a change in terms of the guidance that a lot of uh, organisations are given or even law enforcement are given uh, because, you know, if you give new guidance to the police in regard to something like domestic violence, for example, um, that could have a huge impact when, you know, a change in the law is not necessarily needed. It's your interpretation of a law that's already there. So there are, there are lots of ways to exercise power and get things done um, and the trick is to find them. Well, given, as you said, a lot of special advisors do have so much power. Um, I think, though, this is kind of a almost hidden power because a lot of the population don't actually know what special advisors mm -hmm. are or do. Um, so for those who don't... Which is why they should read my book. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so for, so for <laughs> those who don't, aside from reading your book, what else can they do to inform themselves and how would you uh, go about describing the role? Well, it's, it's, a, it, it's a strange rule in that you're unelected, but then so many people are unelected. There are 96,000 uh, civil servants in Whitehall uh, and none of them is elected. There are so many people who have a huge amount of uh, power over our lives, in whether that's in local government or, in, well, local administration or, for example, in your university in Exeter. Uh, and, and, you know, none of them is elected or very few of them are elected. Um, so it's a, it's this kind of idea about being elected or unelected sort of isn't really a big thing for me. Uh, in terms of special advisors, I think they're a friend, they are an advisor, obviously. They're uh, someone who does the really menial stuff, like getting cough sweets for your minister when they're having a, having a sore throat, to you know going into the Treasury number 10, sitting in meetings with the Prime Minister, um, and uh, you know dealing with terror attacks and things like that. So it's, it's a really wide-ranging job. It's a really interesting job. Um, and it's there as kind of the eyes and ears and, and protector, gatekeeper, really, for your minister. Um, but you are political. I am a member of the Conservative Party. Um, and, you know, you, you go when, when they, well, if the Conservatives fell out of power in 2024, for example, there would be no Conservative special advisors in post. Um, so it's a matter, of, you know, they would all be Labour or whichever other coalition. So um, you've got to, you've got to realise that it's a short term thing and you can, you've got to make an impact quickly and you've almost got to sort of strategically kind of you know count back essentially and say well my minister's probably going to be in this post for maybe a year and a half what can we what can we actually achieve in in that time and sort of work back and say by six months we want to have achieved this by 12 months we want to have achieved this so there's a lot of uh, sort of strategy um and a lot of trying to work out what what is the legacy uh, of your minister going to be because the civil service will and it's their job to, they will happily fill the red box with, you know, stuff that needs to be done, but you need to be very targeted and realise exactly what it, what the what the priorities are, because 
in almost any government department, there are many, many aspects and the special advisor and minister's job is to find out what are the priorities, what do they actually want to do, what do they want to achieve by the time they've left that office. Well, as you mentioned, the job of a, of a special advisor goes from being a friend to a detached bag carrier. In your opinion, where do you think the right balance lies? Clearly, in your case with James Brokenshire, he was a very good friend and you clearly had a huge amount of respect and admiration for him. But is there a thing as being too close? Um, I think there probably is such a thing as being too close. Um, maybe I was, I don't know, but I, I used to take anybody criticising him very personally. Um, but um, I kind of still do, actually, because he's still a friend. But um, no, I think I think you've got to realise you are, at the end of the day, an employee. You are someone who, uh, you know, can be sacked, and many people are. I was, of course, but other people, you know, by their bosses. Um, and that, that relationship was as closer than a usual employee um sort of employee uh, boss relationship it's nonetheless and it's kind of a weird job because you see each other a lot um but at the same time you've got to remember that you are dispensable and you are someone who you know some spats do take a bullet for their boss and that's that's the way it is and that's the way it'll always be i would imagine so you've got to you've got to be careful around that as well of course you had some idea of what special advisors did when you applied uh, given you were a journalist and they they were your main point of contact when you wanted to interview a minister um, so how did your perception of the job compare with the reality oh it was totally different Arden it was totally different um, in terms of what I thought it was um, and there's so much extra stuff that's always kind of sitting in meetings and going and dealing with civil service uh, the structure of the civil service, the structure of what's called private office, these people who uh, run the, the Secretary of State's life, dealing with junior ministers, dealing with ventures. Um, I mean, I think a lot of people think of media as bad, uh, the, that I was their sort of policy special advisors and their media special advisors. Um, and then sometimes their party management ones as well. But people who think a media special advisor's job is just to talk to journalists. I mean, that's, that was maybe 20 to 30% of what I did. There was so much other stuff. Um, and uh, I think that it's it's really, you know, it really took me by surprise, I suppose, what the, what the job actually was versus what I thought it was, but in a, in a pleasant way, and there were lots of other interesting bits and pieces that were there, uh, to say nothing of all the travel, especially at the Northern Ireland office between Belfast and London. Well, you write in your book that the only other profession which uses their phone as much as special advisors are drug dealers. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So how many hours in a day would you be on your phone? And what were you doing? On um, well, I suppose WhatsApp was the main one, phone calls with journalists and um, WhatsApp groups with other special advisors, with my own departmental people, with the departmental press office. Uh, WhatsApp was kind of the main way. Uh, so emails, phone calls, WhatsApp, and, you know, calls from journalists and calls from your minister, calls from, calls from junior ministers, calls from number 10. It just, uh, I mean, it, it depends. But one thing I definitely invested in was kind of one of those, those mobile power packs that you can uh, charge up your phone because if you run out of power, you're in serious, serious difficulty. Uh, but no, lots of lots of time answering email, lots of time sitting in meetings. Um, and uh, yeah, it was when you get, you know, at the end of the week, you get the little kind of update how many, how many hours you spent on the phone and stuff. It was often, you know, you spend an average of seven and a half hours on the phone today and stuff, you know, on average over the course of the week and stuff. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a weird, it's a weird uh, job, but it doesn't last forever. And, you know, I've kind of, since I left in February, I've kind of got my life back. And um, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I'd, I'd do it again in, in a heartbeat. I absolutely would, especially if it was, if it was any opportunity to work for James again, but um, it just, you know, it, it's, it's an amazing privilege. And I think it's funny actually, because some special advisors who complained about the job, um, I mean, you can almost always, uh, if you're any good, you can usually, you know, quit and go and work for a consultancy. He'll pay you more money to do less work. Um, so uh, it, it is it is kind of a lifestyle choice. And actually, that's a problem in terms of diversity, uh, in terms of people, even with small children, for example, people who uh, have other commitments, uh, perhaps caring commitments and things like that. You've got to be kind of always on. Uh, some people have tried to do a part time, some more successfully than others. Um, so it just it, it's a it is pretty pretty relentless. Well, the the Institute of government report on special advisors did mention um, how kind of you know, exclusive the job is, given it, it it can't appeal to certain kinds of lifestyles. What do you think the government can do, perhaps, in altering the code of conduct for special advisors in appealing to 
a wider base of people for the job apart from blog posts <laughs> calling for weirdos <laughs> yes <laughs> weirdos and misfits yeah exactly well i think um it will only, I mean, the job itself will only actually appeal to a certain type of person. Well, not a certain type of person, but certain types of people. Um, there are lots of people who wouldn't want to do it anyway. Um, and it's interesting, administrations towards the end of the administration often find um, it quite hard to recruit people who are willing to, you know, put their life on hold entirely for it. Um, so in terms of appealing to more people, I think, well, the recruitment process, actually, that Dominic Cummings has brought in to, to get people in with this kind of this kind of more formalized sort of four stage recruitment process is actually not a bad thing at all I think um, I haven't really seen the results of that um, because I don't, I don't know the new special advisors who've come in essentially but um, I think it's, it needs to be a bit more probably a bit more reasonable in terms of in terms of time commitments but that's that's tricky especially when you know we live in a 24-hour media um situation you can't really just say no or not answer your phone particularly also if you're you know the, the ministers themselves have really uh you know long hours and work from early in the morning till late at night so it's difficult if you can't sort of shadow them essentially and be where they are um but um so it, it, it's a big dilemma i think it's something that needs to be thought about probably on a cross party basis actually uh, in terms of, of what the what the best way is because you do need you do have some older people who, who work work in specializing which is great um but uh, certainly eth ethnically and um uh, sex as well there's there's really uh, there aren't really enough aren't, aren't nearly enough women um which is a which is a big problem as well well, it, it strikes me that in one respect cabinet ministers and special advisors are very very alike in that you both face enormous pressure whilst having very little time off. So how did you personally deal with those two opposing forces and remain effective at your job? Um, most weekends I just slept. Um, I <laughs> just kind of, um, I mean, I, I sort of got into this really bad habit of listening to the midnight news and Radio 4 and then the Today program again at sort of six o'clock um, so, or seven o'clock sometimes. So. Yeah, I think um, you do need to take time to yourself and um, you do need to kind of switch off the phone sometimes. But uh, most of the time you, can, you just you just can't, um, you know, and, and people who are politicians, especially high ranking politicians, they sign up for this. And, you know, I think there's actually um, a, a, an academic study, maybe even a PhD or, or, or a wider academic study to be done to politicians, families and how they kind of react, how they uh, the sacrifices they make um a lot of um you know i'm not talking about any of the bosses i have but a lot of the a lot of mps i know you know the children get bullied and stuff in school and say oh, what does your dad think about this what does your mom think about this uh do you know even teachers saying that to them which i think is really unfair um so yeah there's a, there's like you, you certainly make a lot of sacrifices there's no doubt about that um i generally slept at the weekends i just i did like one thing at the weekend i saw sort of one friend or for you know a lunch or a coffee or something but um you know, when you find for the sort of 17th uh, Saturday night in a row, you're waiting for the papers to come on Twitter rather than being out with your friends or whatever, um, you need to probably need to have a better life balance. But uh, that's something I, I didn't do particularly well, it must be said. But I, I did enjoy it. And, I, you know, I would take nothing away from that. And I have plenty of time now to do all of that. It's interesting you say you had a weekend to sleep, given Dominic Cummings' blog post in which he said you, would ha you wouldn't have time at weekends off. Did you notice a kind of dynamic? Well, of course, there was a huge change in administration, but under Dominic Cummings's kind of leadership of Span School, did you notice a, a, a very kind of stark change in dynamic among your colleagues? Um, not particularly, to be honest. I think I think Dominic would talk, he talked a lot about oh, you'll need to be come in some weekends and things. And there were weekends I was in the office, but there weren't there weren't very many of them. And mostly the thing is, of course, you can take your laptop home, and you know the civil servants aren't in a weekend, so you can take your laptop home. And you know we certainly had um, you know some of the private office staff and so on were basically available seven days a week anyway. They actually get paid extra money to to sort of have that a life disruption kind of aspect. Um, so yeah, I mean I. I, when Dominic came in, he sort of said, you know, you'll be working all two weekends. I sort of thought, okay, that's, that's fair enough. If I need to do that, I'll do that. But I never really did. I mean, there were, there were certainly, you know, lots of Saturdays and Sundays, Sundays especially, where, you know, the phone would start ringing pretty early. I remember there's one journalist who I think sent me um, sort of 12 uh, messages 
um, sort of before lunchtime on a Sunday about a story he was working on, uh, and I sort of you know was still sort of barely awake um, kind of thing. But you no, know, you, you you know there is there is time to to kind of uh, get some uh, time to yourself, you know, when you when you can. And what about the kind of structural shift in in your job, given Dominic Cummings's desire to centralise the power? of yeah. number 10 and the idea of amalgamating all the special advisors under one head which was which was of course him yeah well cer cer certainly a change in terms of we were paid by the cabinet office for example um there was definitely more centralization in terms of you know approvals and so on um and obviously there were there were more uh, cabinet ministers who had spads kind of imposed on them it's busy told you will take this person rather than you're having your own person so um that that certainly happened that's all you know been in the public domain uh, and so on i didn't sense a massive centralization in terms of um number 10 being any more or less involved in my life as a spad i mean we certainly spoke all the time to number 10 we had we had individual people uh, either in the press side of things or the policy side of things who we spoke to but i didn't sense that that was any more or any less than 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 previously particularly well i like to almost end on on um on a comment that was made recently by and i should say anonymous conservative source and you did mention earlier on that you'd received some pushback to your book but have you been surprised at the reaction of any other former colleagues to the release of, of your new book? No, I think that, um, you know, some people will never be happy, essentially. And also, if you write a book about anything, you're going to upset a few people. So um, I think that it's been fine. People have been very complimentary. I actually got a really nice um, text from someone very senior in number 10 about it. Uh, and then another person in number 10 sent me a little gift actually as well to say well done on becoming a published author. So um, I've been very privileged and very happy with how the book has gone. Um, I think people have left really nice reviews on Amazon as well. I think there are now sort of 12 or 13 of those, which is really nice as well. So I'm just really glad people are reading it and getting something out of it. Um, hopefully, I mean, it's not that serious, you know, it's not, it's not the world's most serious book. It's not going to change your life, um, but it will hopefully give you a bit of insight on a few of the funny stories that I, uh, that I encountered over, over uh, a period of, of three and a half years in, in, uh, in government. And where can people find it? So you can go to tinyurl.com slash spadbook. Uh, you can get it on Amazon, you can get it on Hive, which supports um, independent bookshops. Um, and hopefully in, well, I know Waterstones, for example, is uh, stocking it as are other uh, bookshops, but most people have, as I suppose is often the way, have bought it on Amazon. And uh, that's, um, that's, that seems to be the way most people have, have got it. But I uh, no, really appreciate all the support, Arden, uh, of you and your uh, fellow students at Exeter and elsewhere. Uh, who are watching this and I wish you all the very best. I know it's not an easy time at the moment to be a student uh, in terms of lack of getting out there and seeing people and so on, but I wish you all the very best with your studies and with the future. The link will be in the description, but Peter, thank you so much for joining uh, me today. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, Arden.